As adults, we have all experienced unexpected events that frustrate us or minor irritations that build up until we feel like we are going to explode. Young people experience these same feelings, but they may not automatically know how to calm down. They have to learn calming strategies, such as counting to 10 and deep breathing. Sometimes they may need help from adults to keep them from harming other people and even themselves. In these rare situations, students may require the use of exclusion, seclusion, or restraint. In this video, you will learn about exclusion, seclusion, and restraint, alternatives to these practices, symptoms of physical distress, and positional asphyxia. Each public agency and non-public school must provide professional development to designated school personnel regarding the exclusion, seclusion, and restraint regulations and the appropriate implementation of the policies and procedures developed in accordance with the regulations. At the beginning of each school year, each agency must identify school personnel authorized to serve as school-wide resources to assist in ensuring that exclusion, restraint, and seclusion are utilized properly at the school. These school personnel shall receive training in current, professionally accepted practices and standards regarding positive behavior interventions, strategies, and supports, functional behavior assessment and behavior intervention planning, exclusion, restraint and alternatives to restraint, seclusion, symptoms of physical distress and positional asphyxia. In addition, Baltimore County Public Schools, BCPS, has policies and procedures regarding the use of seclusion and restraint. You should always carefully follow these policies, which are aligned to our state law known as COMAR. If you don't know the policy, ask your school's administrator, IEP chair, or your supervisor. Exclusion, restraint, or seclusion should never be used for the purpose of coercion, discipline, convenience, or retaliation. In this section, we will review the policies and procedures surrounding the use of exclusion. COMAR defines exclusion as the removal of a student to a supervised area for a limited period of time during which the student has an opportunity to regain self-control and is not receiving instruction, including special education, related services, or support. Examples of exclusion may include the student having an unsupervised timeout in the hallway, student held back in the classroom when other students transition to a different activity or class, an office referral, and a referral school support room during which the student is not receiving instruction or services. A student may be asked to go to one of these places or a place similar until he or she is calm and ready to safely transition back to the learning environment. So this leaves us to ask, when can exclusion be used to address a student's behavior? Exclusion may be implemented if the student's behavior unreasonably interferes with a student's learning or the learning of others, the student's behavior constitutes an emergency, and exclusion is necessary to protect a student or other person from imminent, serious, physical harm after other less intrusive, non-physical interventions have failed or been determined inappropriate, exclusion is requested by the student, or if exclusion is supported by the student's behavior intervention plan, called a BIP for short. In most cases, imminent serious physical harm means substantial risk of death, extreme physical pain, protracted and obvious disfigurement, or protracted loss or impairment of the function of a bodily member, organ, or mental faculty. Although exclusion is not as restrictive as seclusion or restraint, there are some very important things to understand and remember. First, let's discuss setting. Staff must have the ability to see the student at all times. This helps to ensure the student's safety. Second, the area for exclusion must be well lit, have proper ventilation and furnishings. This means that a child must not be taken to a dark room with low ventilation and be forced to sit on the cold, hard floor. Lastly, this area must be unlocked and free from barriers that may prevent the student from leaving, which means the student is not locked in a room or intentionally prevented by any obstacles, such as a person or a mat, from leaving the location. If a student is intentionally blocked, for example, by closing the door, 
placing a mat in the doorway and or by staff preventing them from leaving the room, this is no longer exclusion. School personnel shall monitor a student placed in exclusion and provide a student in exclusion with an explanation of the behavior that resulted in the removal and instructions on the behavior required to return to the learning environment. An example may be, Jonathan, you are in a support room because you were throwing chairs. This is unsafe behavior. When you can show us a safe body and a calm voice for five minutes, we can walk back to class. This gives Jonathan both the reason he is excluded and the exact expectations he must meet before returning to the learning environment. School personnel must also ensure that each period of exclusion is appropriate for that student and the severity of their behavior, as well as monitor the amount of time the child is excluded. Exclusion cannot last longer than 30 minutes. What happens after exclusion has been implemented? Parents and school personnel may at any time request a meeting to address the use of exclusion and to conduct a functional behavioral assessment and develop, review, or revise the student's behavior intervention plan, or BIP. School personnel shall consider the need to initiate a referral to a pupil personnel services, or IEP team, if a non-disabled student has experienced excessive exclusion to determine if the student has a disability that may require the provision of special education and related services in accordance with COMAR 13A.05.01. School personnel shall ensure the implementation of appropriate procedures in accordance with COMAR 13A.08.03 if a student with a disability has experienced an excessive period of exclusion that may result in a change of placement. Common misconceptions about exclusion have included considering student walks or breaks with additional adults, instructional assistants, or other adults in the building that are not certified special educators, a space away from the class learning environment, and even sensory breaks as exclusion. It is good to remember that it is not exclusion if out-of-class support is part of the student's BIP or IEP used in a productive nature to prevent behaviors or teach positive behavior practices, used at the duration and frequency as stated in the BIP or IEP, and or with the intention to be faded out. Jenny walks in the hall for five minutes with her AA every hour. Her behavior intervention plan includes frequent breaks. Is this exclusion? The correct answer is no, because breaks are listed in her BIP. This is not exclusion. Remember, Jenny does not have to be in the hallway with a certified teacher in order to access her breaks. It is absolutely fine for the additional adult to take these breaks or walks with Jenny. Jenny is making loud noises in class. The teacher asks the additional adult to walk with Jenny down to the support room. Is this exclusion? Yes, this is exclusion. The student was removed from the learning environment to a supervised area for a period of time during which the student has an opportunity to regain self-control. Jenny is not receiving instruction during this time, including special education, related services, or support. Jenny was not prevented from leaving the support room. Physical restraint or seclusion are prohibited in public agencies and non-public schools until there is an emergency situation and physical restraint or seclusion is necessary to protect a student or other person from imminent, serious, physical harm after other less intrusive non-physical interventions have failed or been determined inappropriate. While physical restraint or seclusion are allowed in limited circumstances, they are crisis-oriented responses that should not be used in lieu of less intrusive, non-physical interventions. Under no circumstances should physical restraint or seclusion be used for discipline or staff convenience. Additionally, parental consent is required. In this section of training, the listener will receive an overview on the use of seclusion to manage emergency situations. COMAR defines seclusion as the confinement of a student alone in a room from which the student is physically prevented from leaving. Seclusion is not approved for use in all school buildings. 
Seclusion can only be implemented by staff who have been trained annually in buildings with approved seclusion rooms that meet the requirements mandated by COMAR. Physical restraint or seclusion may not be used except in emergency situation in order to protect a student or other person from imminent serious physical harm and should only be used by trained personnel when less intrusive interventions have been attempted and failed or been determined inappropriate. Regardless of whether it is included in a student's BIP and IEP, physical restraint or seclusion may not be used as a planned behavioral intervention in response to behavior that does not pose imminent danger of serious physical harm to self or others. It would also be inappropriate to use physical restraint or seclusion as a form of punishment or discipline in response to disrespect, noncompliance, insubordination, or out-of-seat behavior. If a student is placed in seclusion, in addition to the behavioral criteria, the following conditions must be met. The student's records should be reviewed for any health or medical issues, such as severe allergic reactions, asthma, and seizures. The student should be permitted to go to the bathroom or drink water on request. Any signs of medical distress should be in termination of seclusion and immediate services provided by health personnel. If a student has a history of self-injurious behaviors, seclusion should not be used. Seclusion cannot be used in any room in the schoolhouse. The room must meet COMAR regulations. The room must be free of objects and fixtures with which a student could self-inflict bodily harm. Provide school personnel an adequate view of the student from an adjacent area and provide adequate lighting and ventilation. When a student is placed in seclusion, school personnel must observe the student at all times. As with exclusion, school personnel must provide the student with an explanation of the behavior that resulted in the seclusion and instructions on the behavior required to return to the learning environment. School personnel must be sensitive to the student's disability as well as their individual needs. A seclusion event shall be appropriate to the student's developmental level and the severity of the behavior. It may not restrict the student's ability to communicate distress and may not exceed 30 minutes. The school personnel that implement seclusion must be trained in the appropriate use of seclusion annually. A student must always be able to communicate their needs with school personnel, even when in seclusion. School personnel must allow the student access to their specific mode of communication as long as it will not present a harm to self or others. Per the U.S. Department of Education, a student's ability to communicate, including children who only use sign language or other forms of manual communication or assistive technology, should not be restricted unless less restrictive techniques would result in imminent danger of serious physical harm to the students or others. True or false, any room in the school building can be used as a seclusion room. The correct answer is false. A room for seclusion must be free of objects and fixtures with which a student could self-inflict bodily harm, provide school personnel an adequate view of the student from an adjacent area, and provide adequate lighting and ventilation. You should always check with the administration when considering the use of seclusion and a space that must be used for seclusion of a student. You must be trained to implement seclusion. A seclusion room should be identified and administration should ensure that all of the requirements are met prior to the use of seclusion in any school. Stephanie attended a full day training on the use of seclusion two years ago. She has kept up to date with all COMAR regulations since that time and is confident she can implement seclusion safely and correctly. Can she use seclusion in the current school year? The correct answer is no. Although Stephanie has a good amount of training and may be up to date on the most recent changes and regulations, she has not gone through any training in the recent school year. Remember, seclusion can only be implemented by staff who have been trained annually. James has become very upset during math class when he couldn't sit next to one of his friends. James began to throw chairs and curse. Because James' behavior was unsafe and continuous, Mr. Smith was called to assist. Mr. Smith escorted James to the school's calming room. Once there, James attempted to run out of the room and punch staff. 
After two attempts to punch staff and elope, Mr. Smith closed the door to the room and held the handle to keep everyone safe. Is this seclusion? The correct answer is yes. Since Mr. Smith is preventing James from leaving the room, this would be considered seclusion. Mr. Smith must make sure to document this incident as seclusion continuously monitor the student, state the reasons for seclusion, and clearly state the expectations for the student to leave the room. Parents must be notified and every staff member involved must sign the documentation. In this section, we will review the definitions, policies, and procedures surrounding the use of restraint. Restraint is defined by Comar as the use of physical force without the use of any device or material that restricts the free movement of all or a portion of a student's body. In schools, it is a means for regaining behavioral control of a student in order to prevent injury to that person or others. There are three kinds of restraints, mechanical, chemical, and physical. Physical restraint is the use of one's own body to restrict another person's movement. Physical restraint can be dangerous and should only be used in emergencies. Although the intention is to protect or prevent harm, physical restraints may result in serious medical problems, including injury or death by starving the body and brain of oxygen. The proper use of physical restraint requires special training. All staff implementing a restraint procedure must be certified in a BCPS-approved crisis intervention program in order to implement restraint. Chemical and mechanical restraints are prohibited by BCPS. The upcoming slides will go further into detail about policies and procedures surrounding the use of physical restraint. Comar defines physical restraint as the use of physical force without the use of any device or material that restricts the free movement of all or a portion of the student's body. There are BCPS approved training programs that teach staff how to properly implement restraint when needed. Restraint can only be implemented by staff who have been trained. The staff members implementing restraint must be currently certified in the Crisis Intervention Program. Restraint should only be used when there is an emergency situation in which a student's behavior poses the risk of imminent serious physical harm to the student or others and other less intrusive non-physical interventions have been attempted and failed or been determined inappropriate. Examples of behavior that may necessitate restraint if non-physical interventions have not been successful in de-escalation or are inappropriate given the magnitude of the behavior include, but are not limited to, forceful hitting, kicking, biting, head banging, eye gouging, throwing heavy furniture or objects at others, choking, breaking windows, etc. Restraint should never be the first option or be used for behavior such as noncompliance or disrespectful language. Although it may be true that a student screaming in the classroom is disruptive, it is not a cause for the use of restraint. Staff members implementing restraint must continually focus on the safety of the student. Restraint must never exceed 30 minutes. Staff must continuously monitor the student's breathing and physical well-being. Anyone expected to be in situations where restraint is possible must have training in the proper use of restraint. A person implementing restraint must never obstruct a student's respiratory airway or use a technique that impairs breathing or respiratory capacity in any way. This includes techniques in which a staff member places pressure on a student's back or places their body weight on a student's torso or back. Staff may never straddle the body of a student. Never place the student in a face-down position. The face-down position is known as prone position. Prone restraints are illegal in Maryland. Never place pressure on a student's head, torso, or neck or obstruct a staff member's view of the student's face. This includes using a pillow, blanket, carpet, mat, or other item to cover a student's face. Restraint should only be used in case of emergency. Although the intention is to protect and prevent harm, restraint can cause medical problems including injury by death by starving the body and brain of oxygen. The proper use of restraint requires special training. Never use restraint without proper training.
Staff should also never use restraints that were not trained, such as a bear hug type hold or pinning a student against a wall. Physical restraint does not include briefly holding a student to calm or comfort the student, holding a student's hand or arm to escort the student safely from one area to another, and or moving a disruptive student who is unwilling to leave the area if other methods such as counseling have been unsuccessful, or intervening in a fight in accordance with Education Article 7-307, Annotated Code of Maryland. Important points to remember regarding restraints. Restraint is only implemented when there is an emergency situation in which the student's actions pose a clear, present, and imminent physical danger to themselves or others. Restraint is only implemented if less restrictive measures have not effectively de-escalated the risk of injury. Restraint only lasts as long as necessary to resolve the actual risk of danger or harm. Restraint may not exceed 30 minutes. Similar to seclusion, the student must have the ability to communicate effectively while in restraint. This includes students who primarily non-vocal methods, such as by using sign language or assistive technology. Positional asphyxia occurs when a person being restrained is placed in a position in which they cannot breathe properly and are not able to take in enough oxygen. This lack of oxygen can lead to disturbances in the rhythm of the heart and death can result. Some causes of positional asphyxia include face-down floor restraints, which are illegal in Maryland, sitting or lying across a person's back or stomach, and positions in which the person is bent over in such a way that it is difficult to breathe. Certain factors may contribute to an increased likelihood of positional asphyxia. These factors include obesity, extreme physical exertion or struggling prior to or during restraint, breathing problems such as asthma or emphysema, heart disease, and or use of alcohol or drugs. Always remember, students may have health problems that staff members are unaware of or have not been diagnosed. So during each restraint, the student should be considered to be at risk. Staff members implementing restraint must be aware of the signs of physical distress. Signs of physical distress include gurgling or gasping, changes in breathing, such as hyperventilation or hypoventilation, signs of decreased circulation, such as having cold hands or fingers or feet or sudden color changes, flushed or ashy face, bleeding, bruising, or swelling, seizures, unconsciousness, communicating distress, such as making statements like, I can't breathe, or I have chest pain, limpness in the arms and legs or other body parts, or sudden behavioral changes, such as a violent or loud student suddenly becoming passive, quiet, and tranquil. If any of these signs of physical distress are observed, the restraint procedure must be immediately terminated and school health personnel must provide treatment. All staff members implementing and monitoring the implementation of restraint must constantly access the physical well-being of the student to ensure positional asphyxia does not occur. It is important to remember that a person's ability to talk does not mean that their breathing is not being affected. Restrained individuals have gone from a state of no distress to death in a matter of moments, and monitoring the person's status is not a substitute for avoiding high-risk positions. Each time a restraint is used or a student is placed in seclusion by trained school personnel, the event must be documented in the student's educational record. The documentation must be available to the parent or guardian, and the parent or guardian must be notified about the event verbally or in writing within 24 hours unless the student's BIP or IEP requires some other arrangement. School personnel must document the following. Other less intrusive interventions that have failed or been determined inappropriate. The precipitating event immediately preceding the behavior that prompted the use of restraint and or seclusion. The behavior that prompted the use of a restraint and or seclusion. The names of the school personnel who observed the behavior that prompted the use of restraint and or seclusion. 
and the names and signatures of the staff members implementing and monitoring the use of restraint and or seclusion. The use of restraint and or seclusion is described on the IEP. If restraint and or seclusion is utilized without it being on the IEP, the team must convene within 10 days to discuss the addition of restraint and or seclusion to the IEP. If a student has not been identified as a student with disabilities and restraint or seclusion is used, the student must immediately be referred to the school's pupil services team or to the student's IEP team. The school team can then assess whether the student's behavior appears to be an unusual, isolated event or an ongoing interference that needs to be assessed. If restraint or seclusion is used for a student who is already identified as being a student with a disability and the student's IEP or BIP does not include the use of restraint or seclusion, the IEP team must meet within 10 business days of the incident to consider the need for a functional behavioral assessment, the development of appropriate behavior interventions, and the implementation of a behavioral intervention plan. If a student's IEP or BIP does include the use of restraint or seclusion, documents shall specify how often the IEP team will meet to review or revise the document as appropriate. Additional information specific to the intervention is required when either a restraint or seclusion is implemented. When a restraint is implemented, school personnel must also document the type of restraint. When a seclusion is implemented, school personnel must document a justification for initiating the use of seclusion. Both restraint and seclusion, the length of time of the intervention, the student's behavior and reaction during the intervention, and the name and signature of the administrator informed of the use of either restraint and or seclusion. If a student has not been identified as a student with disabilities and restraint or seclusion is used, the student must immediately be referred to the school's pupil services team or the IEP team. The school team can then assess whether the student's behavior appears to be unusual, isolated event, or an ongoing interference that needs to be assessed. If restraint or seclusion is used for a student who already is identified as being a student with a disability and the student's IEP or BIP does not include the use of restraint or seclusion, the IEP team must meet within 10 business days of the incident to consider the need for a Functional Behavioral Assessment FBA, the development of appropriate behavior interventions, and the implementation of a Behavioral Intervention Plan BIP. If a student's IEP or BIP does include the use of restraint or seclusion, the document shall specify how often the IEP team will meet to review or revise the document as appropriate. Parental consent. If restraint or seclusion is to be added to the student's IEP or BIP, the student's parents must provide consent in writing. This form is found in SPS. Parents are not required to consent to restraint or seclusion. Even if a parent does not sign the consent form, restraint or seclusion may still be implemented in emergency situations in order to protect the students or others from imminent serious physical harm. Physical restraint is the use of physical force without the use of any device or material that restricts the free movement of all or a portion of the student's body. Physical restraint is not briefly holding a student to calm or comfort the student, a physical escort, which is a temporary touching or holding of the hand, wrist, arm, shoulder, or back for purposes of inducing a student who is acting out to walk to a safe location, moving a disruptive student who is unwilling to leave the area if other methods such as counseling have been unsuccessful, or intervening in a fight in accordance with Education Article 7-307, Annotated Code of Maryland. Seclusion is the involuntary confinement of a student alone in a room or area from which the student is physically prevented from leaving. Seclusion is not a time out, which is a behavior management technique that is part of an approved program, involves the monitored separation of the student in a non-locked setting, and is implemented for the purpose of calming. 
exclusion, which is the removal of a student to a supervised area for a limited period of time during which the student has an opportunity to regain self-control and is not receiving instruction, including special education, related services, or support. School personnel are encouraged to use the integrated tiered system of supports that include an array of positive behavior interventions, strategies, and supports to increase or decrease targeted student behaviors. Less restrictive non-physical strategies must be attempted and fail or be considered and determined inappropriate prior to the use of physical restraint or seclusion. If a student with a disability is manifesting challenging behaviors, the Individual Education Program, IEP team, should consider instructional and behavior interventions, a functional behavior assessment, and corresponding behavioral intervention plan, and trauma-informed interventions as appropriate. Physical restraint or seclusion should be considered as a last resort to address imminent serious physical harm. As adults and staff working with students in the classroom, there are certain areas in which we need to take ownership and responsibility. One way to know every student's behavioral intervention plan, or BIP. Of course, this doesn't mean you have to know all the BIPs in the school, but you can know all the plans for the students that you work with regularly. Knowing the BIP can help ensure that interventions listed in that plan are implemented consistently and correctly. The student is typically more likely to be successful when the BIP is implemented with fidelity. For example, if the plan states to give the student a break or reward every 25 minutes, make sure you do it even if the student looks to be on task during the time of delivery. This is typically used as a proactive measure that may allow escape, attention, or even an incentive for continued on-task behavior. It may seem that a student is getting out of work or getting too many rewards, but if the student is on task and does not require more restrictive interventions, the plan is working. This is so exclusion, seclusion, and restraint are not overused. You should also know what supports the student's needs that are not on the BIP. This may include specific academic accommodations such as modified work or wait time between responses. Although these types of accommodations may not be included in the BIP, they can be instrumental in keeping a student on task and reduce overall frustration. If a student has an IEP, these supports and accommodations should be described in the Supplementary Aids and Services section of the IEP. It is important to collect and monitor data regarding the frequency that restrictive procedures such as exclusion, seclusion, and restraint are necessary for a particular student. If the school team should use this information to update and revise both IEPs and BIPs to add the supports needed to reduce the frequency of these interventions. Revisions to IEPs and BIPs must be communicated to all staff members working with a particular student to ensure the interventions are implemented consistently across settings. Remember, an emphasis on proactive or preventive strategies is not only better for the student, but also reduces the need for more restrictive procedures. Unfortunately, restraints and seclusion procedures have been abused and misused in schools nationwide. In addition, little research supports using them to change behavior. Preventing a crisis that requires restraint or seclusion is preferable than reacting to a crisis. What you say and how you say it can escalate a crisis or help minimize it. Remember, the student's feelings are real even if you think they aren't justified. Here are some de-escalation strategies. Ignore challenges to your authority. Don't get into a power struggle. Clarify messages. What is the student trying to express? Reflective questions. Oh, I see. You want to listen to your music right now instead of doing your math? Be silent. Give the student time to restate and clarify. Keep it simple. When you do talk, keep the messages short, simple, clear, and direct. Use a calm voice. 
Don't scream when speaking with the student. Be aware of your body language. Make your body language match your words by using calming gestures. Stand at least a foot away from the student. You will still be able to reach them quickly, but you won't seem as threatening. Use physical intervention as a last resort. Redirect a student to a cool down or support room. The student may voluntarily choose to go to that place they perceive as more calming than punitive. Helpful techniques to remember. Remain calm. Avoid overreacting when faced with a student who is upset. If possible, remove peers and onlookers who tend to make the situation worse. Set and enforce reasonable limits. Use physical restraint as a last resort and only if the student is in danger of harming himself, herself, or others.